Myelofibrosis fibrosis is a member of the chronic myeloproliferative neoplasia, which also includes polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia, and chronic myeloid leukemia. There are other uh, members of this class, but these are the four uh, classic types. Patients who present with splenomegaly and anemia, specifically with what we call a left-shifted or leukoerythroblastic peripheral blood smear, should all be considered for myelofibrosis. Good review of the peripheral blood smear is warranted, and then these patients, in order to make a diagnosis, will need a bone marrow examination bone marrow examination to show that there's under, uh, underlying fibrosis, increased reticulin stain, uh, will help confirm the diagnosis. It's important to exclude chronic myeloid leukemia in the various stages of the disease. And then it's also important to understand what is the initiator event. About a, a good large percentage, about a third, will have a JAK2 mutation. Others will have a MIPL, MPL, or a calreticulin. Then there's yet another subset, a rarer subset, which we refer to as triple negative myelofibrosis. So all of this needs to be incorporated in terms of the diagnosis of a patient with chronic myeloproliferative disease, specifically chronic myelofibrosis, and differentiate it from the other members of the family or from other diseases. For patients with uh, polycythemia vera and especially essential thrombocythemia, it's important to differentiate patients with essential thrombocythemia between prefibrotic myelofibrosis. And here we uh, utilize the WHO reticulin stain grade of zero to three, where zero, there's no increase in reticulin fibers, and that patient would fit nicely into essential thrombocythemia versus a patient with a uh, slight increase of reticulin fibers, or uh, WHO1, uh, for reticulin stain. And now we have a patient with prefibrotic uh, fibrosis worse outcome in terms of uh, this patient in terms of prognosis and a higher percentage of a, that patient with essential thrombocythemia transforming into frank myelofibrosis. In order to make the diagnosis of primary myelofibrosis or even secondary, you need to have a higher WHO uh, uh, grading reticulin stain, typically two or three, uh, to confirm the diagnosis. The prognosis for uh, primary myelofibrosis has evolved over the last few years. As the genetic profiling has become more uh, available uh, to many of us, not just in the academic center, but also to community physicians, it has become important uh, to classify patients, not just on the driver mutation, for which there are three, JAK2, MIPL or MPL, and calreticulin, but what additional mutations are present. Many of these additional mutations uh, can affect the overall prognosis in a negative fashion, and it's important to use that uh, in terms of classifying your patient, number one. And number two, as you follow patients over time, the acquisition of new mutations, specifically mutations within the epigenetic pathway, are harbingers of disease progression. And so these are very important factors that are, can be utilized not only in the acad academic community, but by the community physician in terms of accurately determining the prognosis of your patient. Risk assessment for primary myelofibrosis is based on the karyotype. And it's difficult to get a karyotype in many patients because most patients, or at least many patients, will have a dry aspirate. But if you're able to get an aspirate, the uh, karyotypic abnormalities within the metaphases can be very important in terms of determining those patients who have a better prognosis or a worse prognosis. And what I mean by prognosis is risk of transformation to acute myeloid leukemia. So patients with complex karyotypes, chromosome three, chromosome seven, these are typically those mutations that we often see in high-risk leukemia, and not surprising, if they occur in patients with myelofibrosis, they tend to portend a very poor prognosis and a higher risk to leukemic transformation. In addition, the additional uh, epigenetic modifiers, for example, ASXL1, to name one, many exist, are also predict a higher risk of uh, uh, progression to specifically to acute myeloid leukemia, and as a result, a lower overall survival. In terms of classifying a patient's prognosis based on how they present to you clinically when they're in your office, even without a marrow exam. Uh, at initial time, the IWG uh, is a very useful prognostic scoring system, but most of us, uh, to be honest, use the DIP score, which is a scoring system that can be used with time uh, because it's been validated to be used uh, chronologically throughout the patient's therapy.
And this incorporates the patient's age, the white count, the peripheral blast count, the anemia, and the presence or absence of constitutional symptoms into an objective score. And, you, and based on this uh, scoring system, you can stratify patients who have low risk disease with a natural history or overall survival of 200 months, which is 10 years or 15 years. So those patients you try to leave alone versus the patients who have a high risk score where their overall survival is measured in a year or so. Those are patients, if they're young, should be sent for a transplant consultation. And if they're old, really need to in, uh, initiate some type of therapy for their myeloid fibrosis. And then there's the two groups in the middle. But when a patient walks into my office, I typically will calculate their DIP score. I will wait for the marrow examination before I can augment that DIP score with the karyotype and the rest of the mutation panel to really help me help the patient accurately prognosticate their outcome.